Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Lucifer, Satan, Iblis, Beelzebub. These are but some of the many names used to describe the arch-demonic enemy of mankind. A diabolical devil figure appears in history all across the globe. Whether you believe in his existence or not, the hellish mark which the devil has left on the legends and folklores of mankind is indisputable. Many tales describe encounters with this beast. As such, I will share a few historic encounters with the devil. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, many tales describe encounters with the devil himself, yet not all are the same. Sometimes Satan approaches his prey, other times the lost soul goes seeking Lucifer to make a deal. Either way, the results are never favorable. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com where you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also join the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Richard Cabell lived during the 1600s and was the local squire of Brook Manor in Devon, England. He was regarded as a monstrously evil man, a figure of darkness who local legend records as having beaten and abused his wife until one night she escaped, fleeing across the moors with her husband in hot pursuit. It is said that he eventually caught up with the unfortunate woman murdering her and her faithful dog. The ghost of this loyal canine haunted Cabell for the rest of his life. The reason for the squire's darkness, it was said, lay in a deal he had made with the devil. Granted immortality by the beast, Cabell did as he pleased, creating such an infamous legacy that he would later go on to provide the inspiration for Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Hound of the Baskervilles. However, eternal life was not to be his. Cabell died on the 5th of July, 1677, with some saying that he was hunted to death by a pack of phantom hounds bent on revenge. On the night of his interment into the family tomb, it is said that this same pack of phantom hounds came baying across the moor to howl at his grave. From then on, on the anniversary of his death, the hellish phantom of Richard Cabell could be seen stalking the moors and the area around his final resting place. Terrified of the dark figure and his diabolical connection, local people built iron bars around the squire's tomb and placed a huge slab of stone on top of the grave. However, even after taking such precautions, some still report a strange red glow emanating through the iron bars. Some even claim that on certain nights a whole host of demonic creatures gather at his grave, trying to retrieve the promised soul for their master. Saint Dunstan In the 10th century, the religious fate of England was safeguarded by Saint Dunstan, a pious and charitable clergyman 
who held many important ecclesiastical positions throughout his life. By the time of his death, in 988, Dunstan had served as the Archbishop of Canterbury and had reformed monastic life in England, as well as being a skilled artist, harpist, and metalsmith. Not only that, it was said that Dunstan had protected England from the devil himself. According to legend, Dunstan encountered the devil numerous times. The most famous of these encounters occurred whilst he was living as a hermit in a cell at Glastonbury. A talented metalsmith as he was, Dunstan occasionally accepted commissions. One such commission came from an old man who appeared at his window, asking if Dunstan would make a chalice for him. Agreeing, Dunstan began work on the piece. However, when he looked up from his work, he noticed that his visitor had changed. One moment he was the old man, the next a young boy, then a woman. It was then that Dunstan realized his visitor was the devil. Concealing his distress, Dunstan continued to craft the chalice. He picked up his blacksmith's tongs and moved them to the fire. Once they were red hot, he pulled them from the flames, turned on his heel, and seized the devil by the nose with the tongs. Despite the struggling and screams of the devil, Dunstan calmly cast the beast from his cell. On another occasion, Dunstan was sat in his cell playing his harp. As the saint sang his melodious tune, a tramping vagrant approached. This was the devil, once again intent on deceiving the holy man. However, Dunstan was a man of cunning. He once again seized the devil, this time grabbing his diabolic hoof. The saint proceeded to shoo the beast, furiously nailing a metal horseshoe to the devil's hoof. The devil pleaded and cried in pain as Dunstan hammered nail after nail into him. When he was done, Dunstan only agreed to remove the shoe and free the devil after he promised he would never pass through a door over which a horseshoe hangs. And from then on, the hanging of a horseshoe outside one's home has been associated with good luck and protection. Over your threshold, on your mast, be sure the horseshoe's well nailed fast. Almost every country possesses a legend of a devil's bridge. In this respect, the Tyrol region of Austria is no different. Legend reports that one day, a village in the valley of Montafen had their bridge swept away by an overwhelming torrent. The villagers were justifiably concerned, for they depended upon that passage to pass to and from Schruns on the other side of the river, from where they traded and purchased their supplies. Banding together, the villagers applied to the local carpenter, offering him a large sum of money if he would rebuild the vital bridge in three days' time. The carpenter was in disbelief. The money being offered would make his large family rich However, he saw that completing such a great amount of work in just three days was an impossibility. Before making a decision, he begged the villagers for one day of reflection. All that day, up to midnight, the carpenter studied and pondered, frantically searching for a way to rebuild the bridge in a specified time. Angry and annoyed, he could find no solution. Just when he was about to give up and go to bed, a little man wearing a green hat entered the room. The strange man claimed that he could help the carpenter complete the task in the three days. He did, however, have one condition. Once the bridge was finished, the first soul out of the carpenter's house to pass over the bridge would belong to him. So enticed by the large sum of money was he the carpenter agreed to the devil's terms, believing that when the time came, he could cheat the devil. Three days afterwards, the bridge was complete and the devil stood in the middle awaiting his prey. After having remained there for many days, the carpenter at last appeared. Sensing his payment was close at hand, the devil jumped with joy. However, the carpenter was driving one of his goats, and as he approached the bridge, he pushed her on before him and called out, "'There you have the first soul out of my house.'" In a fit of rage at having been so deceived and humiliated, 
the devil seized the goat by the tail and dragged her across the bridge. So hard did the devil handle the creature, her tail came out. Laughed at and mocked by all who saw him with the goat, the devil took off. It is said that since the day the carpenter outsmarted the devil, all goats now have short tails. Robert Johnson, he was an American blues singer, songwriter, and musician. It was his guitar playing ability for which he is most remembered and is still considered to be among the greatest guitarists of all time. Strangely, playing the guitar was not a skill which he was ever known for as a child. The story goes that although he did play it avidly in high school, he was not reported as having any real talent for the guitar. However, at the age of 18, Johnson displayed a mastery of guitar that seemed to come from nowhere. His rapid knowledge of the instrument was inexplicable. He played it with such intimate finesse that the only explanation for it was devilry. According to legend, as a young man living on a plantation in rural Mississippi, Johnson greatly desired to become a great blues musician. The desire was so great he took his guitar to a nearby crossroads. There he was met by the devil, who took his guitar and retuned it. Upon handing it back, Johnson was given mastery of the instrument for the small price of his soul. In the years that followed, Johnson became an itinerant musician, moving from place to place playing his guitar for tips on street corners. He later went on to record several songs. Some say that allusions to Johnson's diabolical pact can be found in several of his own songs, including Crossroad Blues and Me and the Devil. Somewhat ominously, Johnson died under mysterious circumstances in 1938 at the young age of 27. One theory suggests that he was poisoned by the jealous husband of a woman he had flirted with. Another theory is he died of syphilis, Ultimately, no one knows. Not only that, Johnson's gravesite is also a mystery, with at least three different locations having been marked out as possible sites. With Johnson's music now enshrined in the Blues Hall of Fame, one can only wonder if the devil came and collected his fee as agreed. After all, Johnson died at the legendary and possibly cursed age of 27 meaning that he joined other great musicians in that infamous 27 Club, including Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, and Jim Morrison. The Possession of George Lukens On Saturday, May 31, 1788, the Reverend Joseph Easterbrook was alerted to the strange case of George Lukens, a man who claimed to be possessed by the devil. It was one of the reverend's parishioners, Mrs. Sarah Barber, who told him of Lucan's affliction. Upon visiting the village of Yatton in Somerset, a place where she used to live, Mrs. Barber had been disturbed to find a man she once knew in a state of extraordinary illness. George Lucan's, a tailor and common carrier by profession, had been a child of good character who constantly attended the church and sacrament. However, for the last 18 years, his demeanor had shifted. His nature changed. During her stay in the village, she told the reverend she witnessed the unfortunate man have fits multiple times a day, during which he sang and screamed in various sounds, some of which did not resemble a human voice. George had been placed under the care of Mr. Smith, an eminent surgeon, Many other medical gentlemen had also lent their help to Mr. Smith and his patient. All was in vain. No cure could be found for the mysterious malady, with George himself declaring, in the middle of his fits, that no doctor could do him service. Many of the people of the village were convinced the man was bewitched. George himself declared that he was possessed of seven devils. Upon hearing Mr. Barber's recollections, Reverend Eastbrook requested George Lukens visit him. In the Reverend's notes, he described how George made the most horrible noises as his body convulsed. 
experiencing as many as nine fits a day. The man was weak and emaciated. He was also unable to hear religious expressions without writhing in pain. Another witness who published a letter in the local newspaper at the time described how George would declare in a roaring voice that he is the devil before singing a hunting song in a hoarse and frightful voice. They even detailed how, at certain periods of the fit, he was so violent that an assistant was always obliged to be at hand to restrain him from committing some injury to himself. On June 13th, Reverend Easterbrook and several of his friends and colleagues met with George in the vestry room of the church. They began by singing hymns, which immediately caused George to convulse in agitation. His fit became more violent until he spoke in deep, hoarse, hollow voice. The voice declared that it would never quit its hold of George and that any attempt to help the man would cause him to suffer torment a thousand times worse. The voice then started singing in its usual manner, boasting of its power, blaspheming and vowing vengeance on both the unfortunate George and all those who dared to oppose him. As the session continued, other voices manifested, all refusing to release George and warning against any and all attempts to help him. At one point, a voice possessed the man and declared, I am the great devil, before causing George to have such violent convulsions that two men had to restrain him. When the voice thought to be the devil was asked why he tormented George, it answered, that I may show my power amongst men. All the while, George continued to suffer violent convulsions, despite his small size and weakened body. As the session reached its climax, one of the clergymen commanded, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the evil spirit depart from the man. Prayers for his deliverance were offered, and the clergyman's command repeated, George's convulsions and agonies grew stronger. He was by now crying out, howling in miserable pain. Then he was delivered. The convulsions stopped. The devil seemingly departed. George Lukens, previously declared by medical men as incurable, was cured. Up next, I've already shared a few stories of those who've had dealings with the devil, but next I'll share a few cases for the devil's existence when Weird Darkness returns. By the way, I noticed something the other day that pleasantly surprised me. I've been telling you about how I use Magic Mind Mental Performance shot with my morning routine. It's kind of like motivation in a bottle for me. They don't say it that way, but I do. Well, the other day I forgot to take it, uh, but I remembered around lunchtime. This accident turned out to be beneficial because I found that Magic Mind helps me even more if I wait until around lunchtime to take it. I work really late nights here in the Weird Darkness studio doing the podcast and also doing voiceovers for my clients, and Magic Mind, if I take it around noon, it gives me the energy and the motivation that I need for a long workday. If I know in advance that I gotta pull an all-nighter, I might actually try taking it in the late afternoon just to see how effective it really is. Or if you'd like to see for yourself, you can do so for free. Magic Mind is offering you three free bottles so you can see how it works for you. You can cancel any time you're not gonna want to. I'm on a subscription plan with them, so I never run out and I don't have to worry about it. Uh, you can get three free bottles, though, by visiting magicmind.com slash weirddarknesstrial, and then use the code darknesstrial. This is different than the other URL that I gave you before, because I can only offer this for just a few weeks. Visit magicmind.com slash weirddarknesstrial, and then use my code darknesstrial, all one word, and get three free bottles of Magic Mind. Maybe drop me a note, won't you do? Let me know how it works for you. Again, this is for a very short time, so be sure to write this down or just jump online and do it now. MagicMind.com slash WeirdDarknessTrial and then use my code DARKNESSTRIAL 
for your free three mental performance shots of Magic Mind. MagicMind.com slash Weird Darkness Trial, and then my code Darkness Trial. Whatever religion you follow or do not follow, the existence of an arch-demonic being in folklore across time, space, and culture is undeniable. The Devil's Bible, made from more than 160 animal skins and needing two people to lift it, Codex Gigas, also known as the Devil's Bible, was allegedly written in just one night. Herman, the recluse, was a 12th-century Bohemian monk. Legend has it that he was walled up inside of his cell, condemned to atone for his sins by inscribing holy texts for the rest of his days. To complete the great task more quickly and release himself from an early grave, the monk made a pact with the devil. With the devil's aid, the monk supposedly wrote the entire book in a single night, the first half of the tome comprises the entire Latin Vulgate Bible. The remainder is a bizarre mixture of ancient medical treatises, encyclopedias, chronicles, and magical formulas. The Colossal Codex even contains a portrait of Lucifer, purportedly drawn by the fallen angel himself. In experiments conducted to recreate the work, it has been estimated that reproducing the calligraphy alone without the illustrations or embellishments would have taken five years of non-stop writing. Most scholars believe that, working at a regular pace, it should have taken the monk around 30 years to compose the codex. However, academics have remarked at the stability of the handwriting found throughout the book, the suggestion being that the Devil's Bible must have been written over a very short period of time. The Possession of Elizabeth Knapp Born in Massachusetts around 1655, Elizabeth Knapp worked as a household servant for the local reverend. To all who met her, Elizabeth was nothing more than an ordinary young woman. That was until the devil came calling. It was when she was 16 years old that Elizabeth began to show signs of demonic possession. Samuel Willard, the reverend whom she served, documented the case in great detail. First, the girl experienced pains throughout her body. She would yell out, grabbing her leg, her breast, her neck. Often she would exclaim that she was being strangled. Elizabeth would suffer nighttime fits, reporting to have witnessed two persons walking around her as her body convulsed unnaturally. One day, Elizabeth confessed to the reverend that it was the devil himself who was stalking her. She claimed that he had promised her money, youth, ease from labor, and the ability to see the world. He had presented her with a book of blood covenants, which were signed by other women who had been unfortunate enough as to sign away their souls. However, Elizabeth exclaimed that she had been unable to do all that Satan had asked of her, namely to kill the Reverend Willard and his family. As winter approached, the possession escalated. During one of her violent fits, Elizabeth began talking in a strange, deep voice. Willard wrote in his journal how the girl's mouth remained closed as her throat swelled up. In his mind, the devil talked through her body. What makes this case particularly interesting is the detailed and scientific approach which the reverend employed. He called in medical doctors and learned men on several occasions in order to try and find a cure for Elizabeth's symptoms. Possession by the devil was a conclusion only reached after all other options were exhausted. In one of his concluding journal entries, 
Willard stated that Knapp's temperament was unnatural and therefore diabolic. The Devil's Footprints In February 1855, the people of Exestuary in Devon, England awoke to discover the Devil's hoofprints trodden in the snow. The cloven-shaped marks covered a distance of some 40 to 100 miles. Houses, rivers, haystacks, and other obstacles were traversed straight over. The diabolical footprints even appeared on the tops of snow-laden roofs and high walls, as well as leading up to and exiting drain pipes. News of the unexplainable event reached as far as Australia. An extract from a newspaper there exclaimed in confusion that the footprints were to be seen in all kinds of unaccountable places. Investigators have commented that if the tracks really extended for close to 100 miles, no human being would have been able to follow their entire course in a single night. According to Truman's Exeter Flying Post, the case was an excitement worthy of the Dark Ages, and they published a piece on the foot tracks of a most strange and mysterious description. Others, however, thought little of the story's excitement and more of its infernal meaning. In the town of Dawlish, a group of tradesmen were so distressed that they armed themselves with guns and bludgeons. On the morning of the 9th of February, they took off in pursuit of the mysterious footprints. At the time, the bizarre theories were circulated in order to distract local parishioners' concerns about a visit from the devil. The local Reverend Musgrave explained the event away by blaming the footprints on a couple of escaped kangaroos from a private zoo. However, he later recanted in a letter addressed to a London newspaper. I found a very apt opportunity to mention the name of kangaroo in allusion to the report then current. I certainly did not pin my faith to that version of the mystery, but the state of the public mind the villagers, dreading to go out after sunset, under the conviction that this was the devil's work, rendered it very desirable that a turn should be given to such a degraded and vited notion, and I was thankful that a kangaroo served to disperse ideas so derogatory. Until this day, nobody has been able to explain who or what visited the people of Exestuary that night. The Gateway to Hell in Hauska Castle in the Czech Republic. The castle was built with only one purpose, to encase the gateway to hell. But in the middle of nowhere, this imposing Gothic structure was constructed with no fortifications, no water, no kitchen. When it was completed in the 13th century, it had no occupants. Instead, the castles fortified inwards, with its chapel built over a huge bottomless pit acclaimed to be the entrance to hell. Its sole purpose is to keep the devil and his demons at bay. Historic witness reports attest to demonic half-animal, half-man creatures dragging themselves out from its depths. Other reports describe dark, winged creatures pouring out from the endless chasm in order to terrorize the local populace. According to local legend, when construction on the castle began, local prisoners who were sentenced to death were recruited to discover more about the mysterious hole. If they allowed themselves to be lowered by rope into the dark depths, they would receive a pardon. However, when the first of the inmates was lowered, he began screaming after just a few moments. Those holding the rope dragged him back to the surface. The man had wrinkles, his hair had turned white, in a few mere seconds, he had aged by over 30 years. The unfortunate man died of unknown causes only a few days afterwards. During the 1930s, the Nazis supposedly occupied the castle so as to conduct occult experiments with dimensional portals. Years later, during renovations, several Nazi officer skeletons were found there. In the modern day, the castle's ghostly as well as demonic residents are well known and have attracted many paranormal enthusiasts. Sightings include mysterious beasts, a headless black horse, and a distressed spectral woman. 
Beneath the cellar, it is claimed that there are non-human remains of the demons who've managed to claw their way out of hell. And then there's the devil's handwriting itself. According to modern knowledge, there is only one specimen of satanic calligraphy in existence. This curious extract first appeared in 1523, taken from an Italian text which describes an encounter between Lodovicio Spolitano and the devil. Spolitano allegedly summoned Satan, requesting that he use his body as a vessel to write clear and legible answers to a series of questions asked of him. However, the king of hell refused to cooperate and instead snatched the pen into midair so as to rapidly scrawl the answers himself. What the devil wrote was indecipherable, a series of diabolic scrawls that seem as though it should read from left to right. After being passed on to several learned men without success of decryption, the text disappeared into abeyance. As of today, no one has been able to decode the text or make a convincing case for it being a hoax. However, academics have identified traces of some of the manuscript's characters in Amoraic, a language spoken in its purity in the province of Amhara, Ethiopia. According to legend, this was the primeval language spoken in the Garden of Eden. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, including the show's Weirdos Facebook group, on the contact social page at weirddarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Diabolical Dealings with the Devil was written by Laura for Paranormal Scholar. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Mark 12, verse 30. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And a final thought, train your mind and heart to see the good in everything. There is always something to be thankful for. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Want a little bit more of the devil? Well, here's a Church of the Undead for you. One of the signs of the last days is the increase in deception. By that standard alone, it's clear we are living in the last days. One of the weapons in Satan's arsenal that he returns to again and again is deception. Deception is simply tricking someone into believing something that is not true. What makes it deception is because whatever it is you are believing or even experiencing appears real or authentic, but it's not. Satan is a master at this, and he is claiming many victims in these last days. Hello Weirdos, I'm Pastor Darren. Welcome to the Church of the Undead. Here in the Church of the Undead, I can share ideas which are relevant to those who suffer with depression, need some encouragement, and for those who love or are just curious about the God of the Bible. And it doesn't matter if you are a weirdo in Christ or just a weirdo, everybody's welcome here at the Church of the Undead. And I use the word undead because here we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. If you want to join this weirdo congregation, just click that subscribe or follow button and visit us online at WeirdDarkness.com slash church. Full disclosure, I might use the term pastor because I've branded this feature as a church, but I do not have a theology degree, nor did I ever go to Bible college. I'm just a guy who gave his life to Christ in 1989 and has tried to walk the walk ever since, and has stumbled a lot along the way. 
because, like everybody else, I am an imperfect, heavily flawed human being. So please don't take what I say as gospel. Dig into God's Word yourself for confirmation, inspiration, and revelation. That being said, welcome to the Church of the Undead. Satan is a master manipulator, and here in the last days, he might very well be deceiving you without you even realizing it. Here are just a few ways he might be trying to deceive you. The Signs and Wonders Deception One of the most dangerous ways a person can be deceived is by seeking after signs and wonders. If you seek signs and wonders, you will find them, but that's not always a good thing. Some people have become so obsessed with the desire to see signs and wonders, they open themselves up for deception, and most are not even aware. Jesus gave us the greatest sign and wonder you'll ever need to have faith in Him. He rose from the dead. If He never did another miracle, the proof of the empty grave is enough. Matthew 12, verses 39 and 40. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Seeing a miraculous sign should not be the basis for your faith. Your faith should be grounded in believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Does God still do wonders and miracles today? Of course He does, but that's not what we should be seeking after. We should be seeking God and for His presence to come. If signs and wonders come with it, so be it. But don't make that your primary focus because the prize is His presence, not the signs and wonders. The Seeking Experiences Deception Another deception is people who are seeking experiences. We even cater to this by calling our services worship experiences. The need for a new experience often causes people to seek an encounter which involves something happening. There have been many instances when what they end up experiencing does not align with anything in Scripture, yet they use this experience as validation they've encountered God and the Holy Spirit is at work in their life. Since the experience is what they're after, they unknowingly set themselves up for a deception. The greatest evidence the Spirit of God is at work in your life is not what happens in the moment, but what happens over time. Primarily, it is the changed heart that leads to a changed life. When you begin to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, then you'll know for certain God is at work in your life. You don't have to chase the momentary experiences which might produce a temporary high but no real change. Ask the Holy Spirit to work in you, to change your character, because the fruit will be evidence of your transformation and proof of His power being at work in your life. The Similarity Deception Another deception that is becoming more commonplace is one that says all religions are basically the same or all roads lead to the same destination, meaning to heaven. Not only is this not true, this doesn't even make sense. All religions don't even offer the same path to salvation, and some stand in stark contradiction to the others. For this reason alone, it is impossible for them all to be true. Even religions that say they believe in Jesus cannot all be true because they don't agree on who Jesus is. For example, the Jesus of Christianity is different from the Jesus of Islam, Mormonism, or the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because these are all different, they cannot all possibly be true. This same argument can be made for the way of salvation or many of the other beliefs of all the various religions out there. There is only one road to the Father and Jesus has made it clear that He is that way. While there may be encouragements to do good things in every religion, they're not all the same. The truth is that outside of Christ, all other religions will lead you to the same destination. It's just not the destination you think or want. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. 
but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The Scriptural Deception The scriptural deception happens when people falsely believe that the Bible is not enough. Many people are now reading the Bible in conjunction with other books in the hopes of piecing together their own truth. Instead of the Bible being the standard, it just becomes one book of many where you can supposedly find truth. This presents the same problem as the similarity deception, because many of these other books offer reasoning that stands in opposition to the scriptures. When you devalue the Bible to just ancient literature status, then you open the door to be deceived. The Bible is not one of many words of God. The Bible is the Word of God. It is complete and accurate, and for those who miss this, they become prime candidates to fall into deception. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Then there's the everyone goes to heaven deception. There's a belief in our society that everyone goes to heaven. Whenever someone dies, the refrain is always, they are in a better place. Now, if a person was a murderer or some type of violent criminal, we assume their place is in hell, but for everyone else, they are up in the sky looking down on us. Unfortunately, this is simply not true. The Bible is clear about the pathway to heaven, and the truth about life is being born does not get you a ticket to heaven. Being born again does. John 3, verse 3, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. The way to eternal life comes only through Jesus Christ and the heart that has been washed and regenerated through the blood of Christ and has been renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Without this new birth, there is no entrance into heaven. This is not meant to be harsh, but to tell the truth, everyone does not automatically go to heaven, and that's why we must be diligent in sharing the message of the gospel because without it, people have no hope. And finally, the impersonation deception. This is where Satan impersonates the Holy Spirit and, in the process, deceives people. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Often this impersonation leads to visions, dreams, or experiences that lead people away from Christ and causes them to put their trust in something else. One way to be certain it is the Holy Spirit is He will always point to Christ, He will always glorify Christ, and He will always operate within the boundaries of Scripture. The reason He does this is so we can test and know it is His work and not some counterfeit. That's why the more you know the Word of God, the more you'll be able to discern the Spirit of God. This is also the reason Satan tries to move people away from the truth of God's Word, because then they become more easily prone to being deceived. Now that you're aware of these deceptions, your responsibility is to prepare yourself so you don't fall victim to them. However, because you're aware, these can help you identify them and move in a different direction when you see them. If you like what you heard, share this episode with others who you think might also like it. Maybe the person you share it with will want to join this weirdo congregation too. To join this weirdo family yourself, find us on Facebook, listen to previous messages, even find out how to join me in my daily Bible studies, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash church. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash church. You can find the sources I used for this week's message in the show notes. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me, weirdos, and until next time, Jesus loves you, and so do I. God bless. <laughs>